We're here for the 14th annual Louisiana Book Festival and the Louisiana Writer Award presentation. Programs all day at the Capitol, State Library, State Museum, 10 to 5, free open to everybody. Um, we have over 250 authors, stellar weather, uh, so I think we'll see a record turnout. So. Uh, 14th annual Louisiana Book Festival. Like any good festival, we've got to have Louisiana food, and we've got music at the music stage right outside in between the State Library and the State Capitol all day, all, all genres again, and Louisiana vendors selling good Louisiana food. We try to do something for every age group, so we say it's a family event, bring everybody. We've got the children's pavilion, the teen area, storytellers, uh, the costume characters from the storybook, so we literally have something for everybody, and our 250 authors represent all genres, so there should be a, a, an adult program for everybody. It's a wonderful event. Um, Rebecca Hamilton and Mr. Davis do a wonderful job, uh, Gordon, and it's just exciting for me I'm a songwriter you know so it, it's it's really a lot of fun to me for me to pretend to be a literary man and come right <laughs> in and hobnob with all the literary folks um, and there is a strong tradition of of storytelling of poetry and of historiography and there is um, so much wonderful literature that has been created in this place and to be part of that tradition and to be part of cette mouvance, pour moi c'est un grand grand plaisir, you know. Um, so as Louisiana's first French language poet laureate, it's very, I'm very proud to be part of this experience and I'm just glad to be here. I, I think it's wonderful. It's a celebration of literacy, so not just books, not just writing, but also storytelling, songwriting. Uh, and it just shows that we value literacy and we value people who write and, and who have that talent and we want to see it continue, we want to see it uh, perpetuated among our youth. I live in Baton Rouge, this is my first year coming here. I think this is great, it's a good time for all the family, uh, adults and kids alike. What do the kids enjoy the most? Um, my daughter personally just likes going over here and uh, doing all the crafts and the coloring and uh, looking at all the books. What about you? Uh, I like all the books and all the food. The food's great and the music's really good too. So I'm from uh, Grand Cane, Louisiana, just south of Shreveport. We drove down for the book festival and we come every year, my daughter and I, and I'm the librarian at North Soto High School, so I always come and see the authors and get books signed and take back for the kids to read. What's your favorite part of the festival? I like the storyteller tent and I like meeting with the authors. From uh, the Los Angeles area of California, came because uh, I'm an author and aspiring author and film producer. It's just uh, a great atmosphere to be around books and literary types and creative people. So that's, uh, I'm always looking for that and this is my home state so I came back to do some more research also. We are from Plaquemine. We drove up here to check out the book festival and uh, we've gone through a lot of the children's tents, had a good time. What do you think of it so far? It's been great. We've all really enjoyed ourselves. What do the children like the most? Ooh, I don't know. Probably the activity center. <laughs> They've done a lot of craft stuff. We wanted to see how it was over here, and so far we've been very, very interested in a lot of stuff to see and a lot of people, a lot of different things going on. What's your favorite part so far? The books. We love books. Uh, it's a, such a wide selection, so, so many different authors and so many different uh, stations to look at, to visit and all. I brought my daughter to the storytelling tent and it was really great. They had great questions and he gave us so much feedback on all of the, the ins and outs of illustrating a book, working with publishers and how he gets the, the stories and how he wants to relay the feeling of the book and not just make a pretty picture but really give you the feeling of what the story is. Uh, yes, this is my first time, and so far it's been great. I mean, we just arrived here, so we haven't looked around yet, but it looks fun so far. I drove it from home because um, I'm um, I like reading books. Um, you know, it's relaxing me. You know, give me the the spiritual free of what's going on in the world today and everything like that. What's your favorite part of the book festival? Oh, uh, the people just just in, enjoying the people and all of the different books and stuff out here. Uh, I haven't visited all the the booths, so. I think it's good. Yeah, it's great. I see you brought. I saw you brought your children here. What are they looking forward to doing? Uh, they look forward to some books. Maybe they can buy. Today we finally remember Christina Vela, friend, historian, and author, who received the Louisiana Writer Award last year. Um, this year's book festival is dedicated to her. According to her daughter Christy, Christina didn't talk much about awards and such. 
but she talked nonstop for weeks about the Louisiana Wright Award and considered it a highlight of her career. We miss her, or as she would say, we miss you, dear. Today's one of those th days where sad things and happy things make you want to cry. We loved Christina, and um, we were glad to have her with us last year. Good morning. Uh, on behalf of Lieutenant Governor Billy Nungesser and the Center for the Book and the State Library of Louisiana, welcome to the 14th Annual Louisiana Book Festival and the Louisiana Writer Award. The Louisiana Writer Award is given annually by the Center for the Book within the State Library to recognize outstanding contributions to Louisiana's literary and intellectual life as exemplified by a writer's body of work. Past recipients include novelists Ernest Gaines, James Lee Burke, Christine Wiltz, John Biganay, Shirley Ann Grau, Elmore Leonard, Tim Gotro, Valerie Martin, James Wilcox, and Tom Piazza, children's author William Joyce, scholar Lewis P. Simpson, poets William J. Smith, Yosef Kumanyaka, and Daryl Bork, who's with us today, historian Carl Brasso, and of course, beloved historian bi biographer Christina Vella. Today, we officially add to this distinguished list the name of Johnette Downing, the 18th recipient of the Louisiana Writer Award and only the second children's author to receive the award. Called the Pied Piper of Louisiana music traditions, Johnette is a multi-award winning musician and author dedicated to sharing her Louisiana roots music, books, and cultural heritage with children around the world. Johnette's children's music career began organically when a, children's, a fellow children's musician, Judy Stock, told her, you would be great performing for children. After seeing Johnette perform in a folk music trio at the then Neutral Ground Coffee House in New Orleans, once the eureka moment bell rang in Johnette's head, there was no unringing it. Johnette was hired on the spot by troubadour and teacher Philip Melanson to perform at his school. Coincidentally, Philip, a frequent children's entertainer, is at our book festival today, performing later. Johnette worked for many years as an itinerant music therapist for children with special needs for the Jefferson Parish School System and as an early childhood music teacher for Isidore Newman Lower School in New Orleans. Evolving from that initial experience, her educator workshops on how to use music to teach English as a second language has been employed in five continents, on five continents. She is a regular performer at the New Orleans and Jazz Festival, the French Quarter Festival, the Louisiana Book Festival, as well as in schools, libraries, performing arts centers, and museums. For almost a decade, she's performed a free monthly family-friendly Friday in the French Market Concert Series at the New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park Visitor Center. Her first record, Music Time, received five awards, including a Parents Choice Recommended Award. Her next recording, From the Gumbo Pot, celebrated all things dear in Louisiana, earning her a Parents' Choice Silver Honors Award. Her Dixieland Jazz for Children is the first ever jazz recording of its kind with trumpeter Jimmy LaRocca and his original Dixieland Jazz Band. This historic recording received an iParenting Media Award and a Parents' Choice Approved Award. There's no wonder Johnette is considered the musical ambassador to children. Author, freelance writer, and Louisiana Book News columnist Cherie Cohen writes, Johnette Downing's vibrant storytelling makes every book a celebration between the covers. Johnette's career as a published author, like her children's music career, also began organically. Illustrator Deborah Usley Kader Thomas approached Johnette after a library concert and said, I like your Today is Monday in Louisiana song. Do you mind if I illustrate it and submit it to my publisher? Growing from that, Johnette's passion for combining Louisiana roots music and books and for sharing that passion with, passion with children in the way her parents shared it with her led her to write numerous singable books over her 30-year career. Former Louisiana poet Dr. Julie Kane writes, John Dat Downing thinks like a kid but writes like a magician. Her body of work includes 19 picture books, three board books, and 10 recordings. Her first picture book, Today is Monday in Louisiana, which was selected for the Big Read Young Reader component in 2010, is now in its fifth printing and has received a National Parenting Publication Award. Further, it's being petitioned through a grassroots effort by teachers to be the official Louisiana State song for children and has given rise to Today is Monday books for Texas, New York, and Kentucky. 
Johnette is renowned for her original song, story, haiku, and southern, southern folk tales. Her books, Why the Crawfish Lives in the Mud and There Was an Old Lady Who Swallowed Some Bugs, were on the accelerated reader list. Why the Crawfish Lives in the Mud, Petit Pierre and the Floating Marsh, and Mumbo Jumbo, Stay Out of the Gumbo, her latest book, were chosen to represent the state of Louisiana at the National Book Festival in Washington, D.C. in 2008, 2016, and 2017. In addition to her parenting media accolades or New Orleans City Business Magazine Woman of the Year Award, a New Orleans Magazine 2014 Top Female Achievers Award, a Gambit Weekly 40 Under 40 Award, and a New Orleans Magazine 30 People to Watch Award. In 2016, she was commissioned by the Audubon Nature Institute and the New Orleans Pelicans NBA team to write a picture book about a pelican and the wetlands. Petit Pierre and the Floating Marsh, written by her and illustrated by Heather Stanley, was donated by the Audubon Nature Institute and the New Orleans Pelicans as part of their wetlands education initiative to every public library and elementary school in the state at a ceremony at last year's Louisiana Book Festival. In 2017, she received a Grammy participation certificate for co-writing two songs and singing backup vocals on the Grammy Award-winning Best Traditional Blues album, Porcupine Meat, by blues legend Bobby Rush which also earned her husband, producer Scott Billington, his third Grammy. Johnette and Scott are embarking on a new venture as the children's music duo Johnette and Scott with a new record titled Swamp Rock, slated for a 2018 release. Johnette holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in theater from Southeastern Louisiana University in Hammond, and she and Scott live in New Orleans. Later today, she will discuss in detail her body of work with past Louisiana Writer Award recipient Daryl Bork. Through her books and music, Jonna has truly been a champion for literacy throughout our state. Having appeared in 61 of the state's 64 parishes, and I know she plans to make it to the remaining three this coming year. But beyond this, she has been a world ambassador for Louisiana through books and songs that celebrate what is special about Louisiana's culture by sharing that message in the Middle East, Africa, Asia, Europe, Central America, South America, North America, and the Caribbean. On a personal level, I've known Johnette for over a, l- a little over 20 years when we were both starting our careers in books and libraries. Over the years, I've watched with great admiration how hard she works with the children of Louisiana. I'm sorry. <laughs> I could not remember one time when I asked her to help with a project or fill in for someone that had to cancel or work with us on something that she did not say yes. Her first response was always yes, not what is it, always yes. Her legacy will be not only her impressive body of work and the tangible things she gives to us, like books and words and music, but will also be the countless number of children whose lives that she's touched. And I cannot think of a more deserving recipient. Please welcome Johnette Downing, the 2017 Louisiana Writer Award recipient. <laughs> I'm sorry. I am sorry to today. <laughs> oh. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That's t- Got me crying before I, know, I, I started sorry. crying myself. <laughs> and I practiced that to not cry. Thank you so much. Receiving the, the Louisiana Writer Award is truly an honor, and I am deeply grateful and humbled to be listed among such esteemed writers as Ernest Gaines and Chris Wiltz and Daryl Burke, who's here today. I love him. Tom Piazza and John Biganay, all of whom I admire and many of whom are my friends. Thank you to Lieutenant Governor Nungesser for his support of the Louisiana Book Festival. His participation in the festival sends a clear message that literacy matters. I met him for the first time at the donation ceremony for Petit Pierre, and he said that of all the books at the festival last year, mine was his favorite. And he meant that. He, yes, it was, and I thought, wow, I, mean, I was so flattered by his comment, but it really sent a message to me that you know, a lieutenant governor took time out of his busy schedule governing the state to read a children's book. And that really had an impact on me, and it, it, I have so much respect for him for doing that. And I want to thank him for supporting authors and writers, and especially this book festival. 
Um, I have had the pleasure of participating in the Louisiana Book Festival since its inception. I've also had the pleasure, as Rebecca said, of knowing this fabulous lady um, for, like you said, 27 years, I believe. Yeah. Rebecca um, has had the same dedication to sharing the power of books with not only urban children, but rural children. I've seen her out in the little libraries all over the state. She still has that dedication for, for uh, sending the power of books to children today. She's never wavered, and she does it all with an enormous heart. Thank you so much. You're a treasure to our state. And you made me cry right away. <laughs> if ever there was a Southern gentleman, it is Jim Davis. It's fitting, and I know I'm gonna be a little corny here, Jim. It's fitting that his name is Jim, because he is a Jim <laughs> to me, and to everything related to the book. The fact that we even have a Louisiana Center for the Book is a testament to his commitment to literacy in our state. I don't know what I've ever done to deserve his kindness, but I am deeply grateful for you, sir. Together with Robert Wilson, who is an amazing magic maker, he's scheduled, he's, I don't know how he does this, 250 authors at this festival, he schedules every single thing, and he has a staff of about 30 or 40 people. They put this whole festival together with the Lieutenant Governor's Office, the State Librarian, the State Library, the Louisiana Center for the Book, and they give this gift of a book festival to Louisiana every year, and they make it look so easy, and it's not. Let's please give a round of applause for them. That's amazing. <laughs> they, because you do it with heart, that's why it looks easy. Uh, when Rebecca and Jim told me that I was the recipient of this award, I wanted to say, are you sure? Like, really? Today is Monday. Today, I don't know, really? <laughs> Like Daryl Burke, I mean, really? So, but I'm deeply grateful for that. I refrained because I didn't want him to take it back. And then they told me I was only the second children's book author to receive this, the first being William Joyce. And it just goes to show that how much they are committed to children's literature this year. It's a priority for them. It's always been a priority for them. And I want to thank them also for focusing on poetry this year. Uh, it, it's amazing. You've expanded this so much. And uh, I know the poets out there really appreciate it. I'm one of them. Um, my passion is, as Rebecca said, writing and singing about Louisiana culture. And it's ironic for me that the festival art, artwork this year is called Spanish Town by Keith Morris. Perhaps my love for Louisiana culture originates from my connection to my Spanish ancestors who came here and to Louisiana in 1778 from the Canary Islands to colonize and to serve in the American Revolution. They left their volcanic black beaches of Tenerife in the Canary Islands in the Atlantic Ocean, and they arrived in the swamps of Louisiana at Galvez Town, which is now Galvez, Louisiana, in Ascension Parish. In fact, the town of Gonzales is named after an uncle in my family, Gonzales Cavo Line. After floods and disease nearly wiped out Galvez Town, the inhabitants were moved to Spanish Town, and it is poignant for me today because the land grant that my ancestor, Jose Gonzalez Cavo, was given for his service in the American Revolution at the Battle of Baton Rouge is the land upon which we stand at this very moment. So he was given, and when I looked on Google Earth when I first did my ancestry, and I said, what is this big white building on my ancestor's land? <laughs> what is that thing? And what's that little, that little quad or, you know, the, the uh, the barracks, and then I realized it's this building. So it's really amazing for me. It's like my career came full circle today. Today is Monday. Today is Monday. Monday, red beans, all you lucky children. Come and eat it up. Come and eat it up. Why do we eat red beans and rice on Monday? It's wash day, the day we do laundry. You can cook beans slowly all day and do the laundry. At the end of the day, the beans and the laundry are done. Today is Tuesday. Today is Tuesday. Tuesday, po' boys, Monday, red beans. All you lucky children, come and eat it up. Sing it. 
Today is Wednesday. Today is Wednesday. Wednesday gumbo. Tuesday. Monday. All you lucky children, come and eat it up. Come and eat it up. What's a gumbo? It's a soup. And the word gumbo is a West African word. Do you know what it means? Okra. That's right. Today is Thursday. Today is Thursday. Thursday jambalaya. Wednesday gumbo. Tuesday. Monday. Ah, oh, you lucky children. Come and eat it up. Come and eat it up. What's a jambalaya? A rice dish, good. And this dish came to Louisiana from what country? Spain. It's actually paella. A lot of people think it's French, but it's paella, one of a famous dish in Spain. Today is Friday. Today is Friday. Friday catfish. Thursday jambalaya. Wednesday. Tuesday. Monday. All you lucky children, come and eat it up. Come and eat it up. Why do we eat catfish on Friday? Because of all the Catholics in Louisiana, right? And they don't eat meat on Friday, especially during Lent. So they eat seafood instead. Today is Saturday. Today is Saturday. Saturday, crawfish. Friday. Thursday. Wednesday. Tuesday, Monday, all you lucky children, come and eat it up, come and eat it up. Why did I put crawfish on Saturday? Because we, because? So we can party? <laughs> Louisianians love to party, right? And the quickest way to get friends over to your house is have a crawfish boil. Today is Sunday, today is Sunday, Sunday, beignet, Saturday, Friday, Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday, all you lucky children, come and eat it up, come and eat it up. What's a beignet? It's a donut. This is a French pastry, right? So we have French, African, Spanish, Catholic traditions. We have all so many cultures in Louisiana. Plus, we have many more, Native American, German, all different types of cultures. We are definitely a gumbo pot. All oh, you lucky children, come and eat it up. Come and eat it up. Come and eat it up. Job. Thank you. Oh my goodness, it's a beautiful award, and to be given this award by Rebecca Hamilton and, and Jim Davis, and it's just, it's just like a, a dream come true. Yeah. How long have you been a children's author and musician? Thirty years. 2018 will mark my 30th year, so this is a great way to kick off that year. Tell us about. <laughs> okay. Tell us about your your talent. My. Tell us about your talent, music and writing. Oh, I, well, I got that from my parents. They were both uh, musicians, and uh, they both loved to read. So that made, for me, it made the singing-reading connection so much easier and so natural. So most of my books are songs and stories, you know, and then I, have, I also have stories like trickster tales. What's so special about uh, writing and singing to children? Their honesty. I love the honesty of children. They let you know when they like it, and they let you know when you don't like it. But it's just really great to bond with them. And what advice do you have for parents of children? Read to your children. Read to your children. That's so important. And also sing. They don't care what the, the quality of your voice. Read and sing to your children. It's a bonding experience they'll always have with them. This is my first time at the Louisiana Book Festival, and I have had just a great time. I've met so many cool readers and gotten a chance to really connect with them, and I've met a lot of writers that I very much admire, and I've really enjoyed talking with them, too. What advice do you have for someone that may want to consider writing a book? Oh, I'm Bic Hawk. Bic Hawk. B-I-C-H-O-K. Butt in chair, hands on keyboards. If you want to write, you just got to sit down and do it. 
How long did it take you to get your first book published? Um, I started seriously pursuing publication of novels. Uh, it took me from s about seven years and three manuscripts. Before, I mean, I'd published articles and short stories. I've been writing my whole life. But to, to publish a novel, it was a, it, it's a long journey, and it's really competitive, and you have to, like, not understand the word no and just keep going until you find, you know, an agent who really believes in your work. Main thing is to trust your voice. Uh, it, that, that your voice will change uh, as a writer, whether you're a, a children's writer, a, 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 you know, a poet, a, a novelist, a short story writer, your, your voice will change. But at every, every stage along the way, you have to trust that voice that's giving you the stories and giving you the poems. Uh, you know, they, they may not uh, always be the kind, you may not always meet with the kind of success that you want, uh, but it's that voice that will then introduce you to the next voice and the next voice, and, and the voice that you're going to have uh, as what we call a mature writer, uh, you know, a, a writer uh, who's, who's sort of uh, found a use uh, for his or her voice in the world. Uh, and those voices are essential. I've been writing for a long time, many years. I think what brought me to writing initially was music and rhythm. Elliot says poetry begins with the beating of the drum. I think that idea that there's something essential in our nature that wants to be rhythmic and put back in harmony with the natural world. And um, from there, a the journey into falling in love with words. The more they start to I think sense. reading every day and writing every day are essential and obvious. The one that might be slightly less obvious because it's a little bit out of fashion is I recommend memorizing and reciting poetry. I think it's an important way to stock the shelves in your brain with powerful imagery and effective syntax and to take a poem into your body on that muscle memory level, um, I think kind of schools your ear. I think poetry educates the emotions, and while we think our emotions are accessible and understandable, that's very rarely the case. It's hard work to know how we feel, and poetry prepares us imaginatively and cognitively to understand life's experiences and to make better decisions. I pitched a book about the Louisiana health care system. And he said, well, maybe one day, but right now I'd really love to see you write something about Hollywood South. And I was involved in it. So it was, I had stories to tell. And I thought, well, I better write these stories now because I hear people telling different versions of things that I witnessed. So I said, well, I'm going to tell my story. What's the premise behind, what, what's one thing that you want your reader to take away from that book? That it wasn't a one-time event. There have been movies made in Louisiana since the 1890s. And the first movie theater in America opened on Canal Street. Mm. Until then, people would uh, just stand and watch these short films, but they actually put seats in the theater, and 400 people filled it to watch movies at that time. My book is called The Last True Love Story. It's about uh, two teens who spring an Alzheimer's-afflicted grandfather from an assisted living facility in Los Angeles, take him on a cross-country road trip to upstate New York to the hill where he first kissed his wife so that he can try to hold on to memories of her before the disease wipes them all away. And it's a quixotic adventure that is, in fact, all an homage to the Odyssey. They're trying to get to Ithaca, New York. And if you imagine Odysseus with Alzheimer's disease... Um, and a sort of young Telemachus who's helping him try to get uh, back to where he, uh, in his Penelope, basically. Um, the book is uh, called The Last True Love Story because it's a dual love story. It's about the grandfather trying to remember the love story, the great love story of his life, and it's about these two teens who are falling in love for the first time and how sometimes that feeling of first love, of falling in love for the first time, is very well the only story you really want to hold on to and remember at, it, at the end of life. It's based on a true story, because <laughs> uh, my grandfather died from Alzheimer's disease, and uh, when he was near the end of his life, I went on a quixotic, ill-advised adventure with my grandfather to Ireland, uh, back to the village where his family is from. And the idea was to give him this one last adventure. Um, and while we were there, I was trying to, I, I was interviewing my grandfather at night and I would ask him questions. And I was trying to get stories of the kind of hard scrabble Irish immigrant life in Western Massachusetts. But um, he didn't want to tell that story. 
the only story he wanted to tell me, uh, because as his mind kind of wandered, uh, as he would, you know, get lost in his mm-hmm. storytelling, the only story he wanted to tell me was the story of how uh, he fell in love with my grandmother and why he remained in love with her for the rest of his life. And so for me, I felt like that's the story I want to tell. Um, maybe the only lesson that we really need to be passing on to our next generation is how to be better at loving each other. I've been living in New Orleans for my entire adult life, and I've written two books on New Orleans, several articles on New Orleans. And so I thought, you know, I've studied in the libraries, and I've taught New Orleans literature, and so I thought I really did um, have a grasp on it. But when I saw the scope um, of what we were trying to do, the 300 years, um, I guess what I learned was that our influence on the world and the world's influence on us is undeniable and greater than I don't know that, that I ever expected, really, that I ever expected. By the time I'd finished high school, I'd been in 17 foster homes, three institutions, and a boys ranch. And so I wanted to write my story just to help other kids. Uh, my book, Aging Out, is the sort of the issues of what happens when a kid turns 18 and gets out of the foster care system. Tell us about the tour of Louisiana schools. So uh, Jim Davis and the State Library booked me with about probably 11 schools. So I came here Monday and uh, just spent, uh, went to about 11 schools uh, talking to the elementary school kids, the high schools, just sort of sharing my story. What we found is a lot of these kids have sort of lost hope. So we wanted to show them um, that in the middle of all sorts of different circumstances that they could overcome. What advice do you have for uh, people? Uh, what's the message out of your books regarding foster care? Well, foster care is one of the most misunderstood things. Um, a lot of people think that a lot of foster care kids have been in trouble, or um, but uh, statistics show that foster kids, most of them are there because of neglect, um, even more so of abuse. So I want to show kids that no matter what happens, that um, there are people around you and you can overcome. So it's just important to reach out and connect with uh, people that can provide care and support for you so you can do something with yourself. Uh, one of the main things I tell kids is what's true about you today does not have to be true about you tomorrow. So you can overcome um, as long as you sort of do your best to put those past pains and hurts uh, behind you and try to move forward to be healthy. My book is called A Tip Tap Tale, and it's about Boozoo, a Louisiana mud brown hound dog who loves to play a hand-me-down guitar in the swamps of Louisiana. And a slick, slick Jim Jack, a cat from New Orleans, comes, here's a rumor from Shady Sadie about this guitar playing hound dog in the swamps and he drives his Cadillac and he he checks him out and he's like come to New Orleans with me and sing that song that crazy rockin' hound dog song and uh, so Boozoo says that sounds like a good idea so he goes to New Orleans and he gets dressed up in his dandy duds and he gets a pompadour and he he goes on stage and he performs and the crowd goes wild and they say we love this dog but there's a pesky flea that follows him and in the middle of his encore, the flea bites him and he, he drops his guitar and his hind leg goes to work and the crowd goes quiet. And they're like, he's just an old hound dog. And he looks and he says, oh, they don't like me anymore. I, I think I'll just take a deep bow wow and head on back home to the swamp where I can, a dog can be a dog. But, um, <laughs> but he, uh, once he gets there, uh, every now and then, the full moon glitter of New Orleans and the, being on stage calls him back flea powder in hand to sing and, and jump and jive and sing and shout and hear, them, hear the crowd say, sing us one more song, you crazy dog. We, uh, we, we love you. You're a hip hot dog, a happening dog. I'm here to talk about my newest book called The Best Man. Uh, it's for young readers on the approach to puberty in the uh, older age junior, uh, elementary school, a, a boy on the flight path to puberty, and his role models, his grandfather, an eminent man who is going to lose, his father who's trying to be a good father to his son and a good son to his father, and his uncle who is his hero, and the best teacher in his school, Mr. McCloyd. And then, because it's 2014, 
one of his role models, the teacher, and his uncle want to marry. I started the novel when same-sex marriage was made legal in the state of Illinois, where I came from, and before I finished the book, it was the law of the land and people could marry whom they wanted. When I was a kid, somebody gave me a typewriter and out of a sense of a Catholic guilt, I couldn't let it just sit there and do nothing. So I got some pen pals and uh, began to write things to them. And uh, I got one that uh, I would write to like twice a week, and he lived in Canada. Naturally, in the 1950s, I ran out of things to say about life in Morgan City, Louisiana. So I started making stuff up, and I believe that was the birth of my fiction. I told him I had a pet alligator that I kept in the backyard and that I would ride him around on a saddle. My book is called Goodbye Days. It came out in March of this year, and it's about a young man struggling with grief and guilt after an accident that killed his three best friends. And it's an accident that he may have caused by texting them while they were driving to come pick him up. So the title comes from the grandmother of one of the boys who died invites my main character to spend one last goodbye day with her where they do all the things they would have done with the deceased grandson and, and friend if they'd had the chance before he died. And then my main character goes on goodbye days with the other two families as they kind of work out their, their grief and all of their issues. So kind of a lighthearted comedy really. I have a personality quirk where if I'm afraid of something, I kind of have to ride out and confront it in the field. And so I've never experienced a loss like the one my character experiences in Goodbye Days. And the thought of experiencing such a massive loss really scares me. And so because that scared me, I had to confront it in some way. And so I did it through this book and sort of tried to imagine how I would work through the, the grief I would experience in, in a situation like that. I've not always been a writer. I've been a writer since about 2013, and I was a musician before then in Nashville, and I decided to become a writer after I started working with teenagers at a music camp. And I really fell in love with the way that teenagers approach the art that they love and the way they allow it to kind of write itself onto their hearts and brand them indelibly. And so I wanted to create art for that audience. And by that point, I was far too old to be making the kind of music that gets marketed to young adults. I mean, I'm old enough to be Justin Bieber's father, right? So I had to switch to something that was a little more forgiving of my terribly advanced age. And that happened to be publishing. Toni Morrison published her first book when she was 39. So publishing allows you to kind of get into the game a little bit later with a little more life experience. So that's why I switched to writing, was to reach teenagers. If juggling had been the way to reach teenagers, I would be a juggler right now. I'm the co-editor with Grace Bauer of a new anthology called Nasty Women Poets, an unapologetic anthology of subversive verse. It contains poems by 215 women poets from all over the country and about a dozen foreign countries as well. And it was inspired um, during the last election cycle when the word nasty was getting thrown around at um, to mean a woman who was intelligent and outspoken. So we decided to claim it as a sort of badge of pride. And our, our anthology is really poems about women who were just bold, proud, outspoken, defying limitations, um, pr providing role models so little girls can dream big. That's, that's what it is. What kind of response have you had from the book? Outstanding. It's only been out, you know, a matter of weeks. We haven't even, you know, had a review yet. You know, there are some that are, that are due to come in. But um, right off the bat, you know, we've been, we've been getting, we have four, um, you know, all-star reviews on Amazon, you know, as, as many as you can get. And we have people, you know, just saying that, you know, it moved them to tears, some of the work in it. I've been coming down to New Orleans from New York City, where I live since the 1980s. And I've also been bringing a college student group in an American Studies class I teach called New Orleans. And so I finally decided to do a book on it. I I've, I've, have lots of connections I've built up with musicians over many, many years. And I used to take notes just for my own pleasure. And then I realized this could be a, a book. And so I've been interviewing um, dozens and dozens of New Orleans musicians, some of whom are famous, like Alan Toussaint, some of whom are semi-famous, like Leroy Jones, many of whom nobody knows about, who are really, in, in many cases, some of the most superb musicians of all. And 
it's a book about how things started changing in New Orleans in the 90s to the point where now I, th I really think the city is experiencing the greatest renaissance musically since the Armstrong era. It surprised me how friendly the musicians were and how humble they are. And these are people who, um, many of whom are like trombone shorty, are very prominent musicians now, John Baptiste. It also surprised me how many of them do regular gigs in New York now since the flood. And so I get the best of both worlds. I get to hear them in New York and I get to hear them in New Orleans, but they sound better in New Orleans because the audience is better and because the audience is more alive. Um, <clears throat> they don't sit there like it's a graduate seminar in jazz. <laughs> they dance and carry on, but they're into the music at the same time in a completely interactive way. I'm a mother first and foremost, and when they were little bitty, I would sing them to sleep, and I got bored with lullabies and didn't know a whole lot of lullabies, so I've always been a storyteller and um, was always the storyteller in all my classrooms growing up, so I just started writing stories and singing them, and sometimes they rhyme, sometimes they don't, and I have... Um, I just started making albums and singing songs and sharing my music and um, that's how it all came about was just being a mother and playing for my children. I think sitting down on a park bench and watching the world go by is way more interesting and unique than going to movie theaters. Absolutely. I had been chipping away, writing on my own. Um, I had an encounter with somebody that was incredibly influential on me, a guy named Brendan Mullen, who had been one of the, he was the guy that basically started ground zero for the punk rock movement in Los Angeles. In the basement, um, it, w it would be almost like a, an atomic bomb shelter mm -hmm. under uh, a, just a, cinder block, cement, you could park like 12 cars in the space. <laughs> in an alleyway, you would go down the steps into this pretty much um, indestructible building underneath what was the Pussycat Theater, which was the porno chain in Southern California. So that was kind of a landmark. Drive down Hollywood Boulevard until you see the Pussycat Theater sign, and then you'll know, just go right behind that building, and you'll see all of the freaks in the alleyway, and then you would know that that's where you were going to go to see the germs or the weirdos or the dickies or the plugs or the flesh eaters or x we were talking about john doe who was doing he did last year what i'm doing this year i have a friend who uh, is responsible for the new orleans saints fight song who dat gonna beat them saints who dat who dat which was a conversation that he overheard in the parking lot, his sister, who is a teacher here in the state of Louisiana, and one day he just happened to be walking through the parking lot, and there were a couple of old soul brothers having a couple of drinks, getting warmed up for the gig indoors, and... He just overheard their conversation. It was like, who that going to beat them saints this week? Who, 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 who who's going to beat the saints this week? And the other guy said, yeah, who that? Who that going to beat them saints? <laughs> the latest book I did is called The Beatles and Sgt. Pepper, A Fan's Perspective, and that's F-A-N-S apostrophe perspective, and it goes over the Beatles landmark Sgt. Pepper album. Uh, the first section of the book talks about how the album was received in the United States, United Kingdom, and Canada, and a few other essays, most of them written by me, but a few by other uh, Beatle fans. The last section of the book covers how the songs were written and recorded, how the album cover was put together, the fancy packaging, and the whole bit. In the middle section is really the heart of the book, the fan's perspective. And what I did was I went online, and I asked people to just send me 
their feelings about Sergeant Pepper and what it meant to them, just everyday people. And after I got a bunch of those, I started noticing certain themes. For example, I noticed that it brought generations together, where someone would say that, uh, you know, my father really liked the song when I'm 64. And so I remembered that song, and he said that his father had passed a few years ago, but when he turned 64 two years from now, he was going to be singing it with gusto, thinking of his dad. And other people talked about how their parents bought them the album. Things along those lines, very interesting. And then I started getting things from musicians, because after all, musicians are big Beatle fans. First one I got was a guy named Barry Winslow, who was with the Royal Guardsmen. And in the summertime, he was getting ready to do a recording session to record Snoopy's Christmas. And he heard Sgt. Pepper, so you can imagine the difference between those two styles. And then I started contacting some people. Uh, Peter Tork of the Monkees wrote a real heartfelt piece of what Pepper meant to him. And one of the more interesting ones, Billy Joel, had a wonderful story about the first time he heard Sgt. Pepper. So it was a really fun project to put together, and uh, glad that I did it. It was my ninth book on the Beatles, and uh, I think it's certainly one of my favorite that I've done. My book, Guide Books to Sin, the Blue Books of Storyville, New Orleans, is an annotated bibliography of the prostitution guides (laughs) that were issued throughout the Storyville period, roughly between 1898 and 1917. Uh, There has been another annotated bibliography that was published 80 years ago, and it was so full of errors, but so many collectors and uh, people in the trade were relying on it. And I worked so closely with a collection that we had that had an interesting provenance Mm. that I had to write this book to set the record straight on the bibliographical information about these guidebooks to sin. So that was your inspiration for the book, was to set the record straight? Well, as long as I was working with these, and the longer I worked with these collections of uh, prostitution guides, what information I was able to gather about them, in checking with sources, I found out that they were all incorrect, and... I felt that if I didn't get something down, when I retired, all the information in my head would go with me. So I had to write something authoritative, and I was fortunate enough that our board of directors and our publications division accepted the project, and I had a very good editor, and we worked together to really put out a uh, high-quality scholarly and yet entertaining book about Storyville and uh, about the bibliographic aspect of the uh, world's oldest profession. I'm working on a book right now, it's called The Lord's Acre, and it's about a cult uh, in near the town where I grew up in Folsom, uh, in a little town called Franklinton. But there was never a cult there uh, in reality. I'm just sort of inventing a a story about that. Where do you get your inspirations from? Really all from place, you know, where I grew up. I grew up in Folsom, which is a little bitty, it's not even a town, it's a village uh, north of Covington where Walker Percy was from or lived. Um, And just that place uh, has just always inspired me ever since I was a kid. It's just, you know, it's, there's no other place like it to me. Oh, what kind of advice would you give young authors? Work really, really hard. Don't uh, get discouraged by criticism um, because you will get it, you know, and you'll get rejections. Um, but I, I think those are useful. You know, I've learned a lot from, from criticism. and I've learned a lot from the rejections I've gotten. But, uh, you know, I've, I've taken all that and, and try to make it part of my, my arsenal. My book is called The Birds of Opulence, and it's about... Um, three generations of an African-American family in rural Kentucky and how they deal with um, mental illness, sort of an ancestral trait of mental illness. Mental illness has been one of the haunts of all all of my books, um, and I think it's because there's been mental illness in my family. My mother suffered from mental illness for a number of years. These ideas are always processing. Uh, so it's the one that keeps coming back. I always call them haunts when I'm teaching. I say, you know, write what haunts you. So those things that come back again and, and 
won't leave me alone and say, you know, you need to write this one. Um, and then I write that one and then something else comes up and says, write me, write me, write me. And um, that's, that's how I, I do it. And it, there's always a thread of truth in the fiction that I write. Sometimes that thread of truth is as thin as a hair on your head and sometimes it's thick as a rope. Sometimes it's in setting. Sometimes it's in a family story. Write what haunts you. Uh, those things that won't leave you alone, even though you may not feel that that's sort of the mainstream thing to write. And then I take from the book of, uh, of the wonderful Ernest Gaines. You know, he said he had six things on his list, and they were read, 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 then write, write, write. My book is called Dead Center, How Political Polarization Divided America and What We Can Do About It. And what I talk about, I served three terms in Congress, and during that time I was rated to have the most centrist voting record in the entire House of Representatives. So I talk about ways that we can bring the country together to bridge the partisan divide. And it's a pretty interesting example. We have partisans, who, uh, studies on the way partisans think, uh, the way they react in different circumstances, group dynamics. There are uh, a number of systemic problems that lead to polarization, gerrymandering, campaign finance, the partisan sorting of Americans and into like-minded communities. And then I weave throughout that anecdotes from my career in Congress as a centrist to supplement those themes. And then in the end, I offer recommendations to solve the problem. How was it to make the transition from politician to author? Writing a book is very difficult. If you want to do a good job and you have a lot of research, it, it takes a long time. And, and it's uh, something, my first, it's my first book. It's something I haven't done before. It's a very gratifying experience, but it's a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. What advice do you have for uh, first-time authors? Just be persistent. You're going to start the process with a lot of big ideas. You're going to get your resources and look at that stack of books and, and documents that you want to uh, read through and use as sources. And it's going to just seem overwhelming in the beginning. But step by step, if, if you put your, uh, put your house in order and, and do the pieces one by one, eventually you get to the end and you have a finished product and you'll be glad with the result. My book is called The Pulp with Queen's Tear Wearing Book Sharing Guide to Life. And it's my story about how books save me. It's a memoir and it's a story about how I started the largest meeting and discussing book club in the world, The Pulp with Queen's. Oh, and so you wrote a book on the book club. Yes, I wrote a book on the book club and about, um, it's kind of an interesting story because in the book I also give, um, each chapter has references to great reads and it has lists of books. So it was endorsed by the Texas Library Association and um, the year it came out it got top Texas books, top 10 Texas books. So um, now I'm promoting my authors here this weekend. I'm doing a Pulpwood Queen panel with some of my authors because that's what I do. I help undiscovered authors get discovered in a big way. What do you think is helpful for undiscovered authors is to get them going? Well, I would say um, because of my book club, so many of my authors have gone on to some really big things. Um, some of the undiscovered authors we picked were Jeanette Walls, The Glass Castle, um, Ron Hall of Same Kind of Different as Me, Catherine Stockett of The Help, um, Elizabeth Gilbert, Eat, Pray, Love, um, and our very first book was Rebecca Wells, A Louisiana Book, A Divine Secret of the Yaya Sisterhood. I have been writing from a very early age. Right now I'm currently a college student at the University of Tulsa. I have three novels out. My newest one is a uh, story about a boy with Down syndrome befriending a cheerleader. So it's a very emotional story that I think needed to be told about the dangers of bullying. I also have three podcasts, two of which were have been on the iTunes top 50 list, and I have a couple podcasts, uh, best podcast of the year nominations. So I'm very grateful for that going into uh, 2018, and we'll kind of see where, where 2018 takes us in podcasting. What was your inspiration for this current bo book? It was a book where um, as a high school student is when I started writing it my senior year and I just saw a lot of bullying and stuff in high school and even to the point of seeing some kids that were picked on and ex essentially exiled at lunch and those were the kids that there was one in particular that we invited to come set with us the uh, the basketball players and he came and sat with us and we kind of struck up a friendship and I thought that from that point forward that it was just that really impacted me and I thought that was a story that I needed to tell the book's called special and it's just a book that I hope changes some lives and makes people think before they, before they judge others from being different than them. 
I started writing at university, I was at university in Oxford in England, and I discovered that if I wrote reviews of books and records, I got free books and records, which was a pretty good way to start writing. And immediately after that, I started reviewing live concerts. So by the time I left university, I'd reviewed dozens of concerts, reviewed dozens of books, and had a very large record collection. So that was what really what got me going in the first place. What advice do you have to someone that maybe want to become an author someday? I think you have to write about things that really enthuse you, that you need to be uh, absolutely committed to. If you're not, it always comes through in the prose. If you're somebody who really believes in what you're writing, who has a passion for it, then that will come across. So I'd say find your passion and write about it. It's, um, it's a Viola Valentine mystery. Um, Viola Valentine was a woman who is from New Orleans, who went through Katrina, ended up on a roof for for a couple of nights and it opened a psychic door so now she sees ghosts that have died by water but um, she decides to quit her job well actually her job kind of washes away and she becomes a travel writer and every time she goes on a trip she sees ghosts that she has their mysteries she has to solve and your imagination thought this wonderful viola <laughs> it does i am a travel writer and my day job and i'm from new orleans and i love ghosts so it just all kind of came together so writing is 10 percent inspiration and 90 percent perspiration that is you know it's <laughs> it's it's work you know and, and you have to be dedicated to work hemingway said the solution is ass and chair <laughs> you know you basically have to sit down and make yourself want to do it and then you know and then you have to be determined to tell your story in your own voice i think that's important and again it's it's discipline you just you know you have to i, I know it, it sounds unromantic to look at it as a job but it, at some point it becomes a job but it's a beautiful job if you that is if you apply yourself and do it as a job then it becomes a beautiful thing so that's what i would say is like you know just work hard and be disciplined and work out a schedule it doesn't have to be seven days a week it might just be five days a week but you always have to make time to do and tell the story that you want i meet so many people oh i've been working on a novel or i love to write a novel but i can't find the time well that's just not true i mean you can't find the time because you don't want to this is one of the best book festivals I've ever been to. We have a lot of them in the UK, which take place in many different venues. And of course, like here, there are plenty of tents, but in the UK, it's a much colder place. The tents are always zipped up and you have to scuttle from one to the next. Uh, here, the open air and what I hope is going to be the sunny rest of day makes it a gorgeous outdoor event as well as an indoor one. Your reaction to everything that you've seen and heard here today? Amazing. Um, smiling faces, little families together, amazing weather, um, a love of the written word and a love of Louisiana, which is always inspiring to me. Um, so I think it's going to be an amazing day. If people have questions like more information about next year's book festival, what should they do? They could go to our website, www.louisianabookfestival.org.